Um, so um, I want to thank Lisa. I, Lisa actually kind of gave a great preface, you might say, to everything that I'm going to be talking about here. Really helped to set the tone. Um, what we're going to do here. Uh, just this picture. I I love this picture. It shows everybody is capable of attending mass. We got the little kids. We got the the uh, elderly, the handicapped. The traditional mass is for everyone. We don't need a children's mass for the traditional mass because it speaks to everyone. There's something there for everyone. Um, as as Lisa pointed out, there's there's the visual cues, there's the audio cues, there's 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 something for everyone. Uh, so I, I do want to paint scenario uh, for you. So how many of you guys are Cup fans here? Okay, we got one. Okay. I'm, I'm a Cubby fan. I'm actually originally from Chicago area. Uh, how many guys have ever met a Cubs fan? Okay, they're unlike any other baseball fan. You would agree? Yes. Yes. Okay, we're crazy. Okay. Uh, my wife got to actually uh, uh, experience once we were in Chicago. We were on the L, and uh, the Cubs game just let out. They did lose, but the the which seemed to be the course up until you know recently, uh, but uh, you know the fact was these guys were so full of enthusiasm. Just like I've never seen anything like this. I mean, you know, there's a hundred Cub fans uh, packed into this, into this L train car, and she couldn't believe their enthusiasm, even though they had just lost. Um, so there's nothing like it. So I want to paint the scenario. Imagine you're in the stadium and the Cubs are at the World Series, <coughs> which is a in itself after over 100 years, despite the fact that three guys actually ate an entire goat to try to break the curse, which didn't work that year. And so you imagine you're at Wrigley Field, and let's start out with the national anthem. Nobody stands up. Nobody puts their hand over their chest. Nobody sings the national anthem. And it gets worse. No one actually cheers their favorite team during the game, even though the Cubbies are miraculously beating the St. Louis Cardinals, our arch rival. And they even win. And everyone's death silent. And everyone just stays in their seats. And this even after waiting 100 years for this momentous event. <coughs> now, unfortunately, something similar of a scenario often plays out at the traditional mass. And unfortunately, there's nothing new about that. Um, by dramatic contrast, one of the most momentous masses I ever got to attend was, there was a, there's a pilgrimage that still goes on. It's the pilgrimage to uh, the Shrine of Our Lady of Charles uh, in Starkenburg, Missouri. And it's organized by the Society of St. Pius X. They, to be honest, they actually resurrected that shrine to some degree because it, the Archdiocese of St. Louis was doing absolutely nothing. Um, so suddenly you have, you know, 500 people from all over the country descending on this shrine dedicated to Our Lady of Sorrows, which was just, of course, uh, a couple days ago, the, her feast, or yesterday, her feast. Um, there was, the shrine <coughs> church is way too small. It only fit about 100 people, but just literally a stone throw away is St. Martin's Parish, which has been closed down, but it's a museum. It holds about maybe 200, 250 people, okay? It's a small German neo-Gothic church. And somehow we managed to crush inside 500 people for this <laughs> mass that came at the end of the 13-mile pilgrimage at night, everyone's tired. I happen to be the master of ceremonies for the solemn mass, we processed into this church. I could not believe the walls of this church were vibrating with the singing. Everybody in this church was singing. A good friend of mine, Barbie Porter, said, I don't even sing, usually. And I was singing. I was so captivated by what was going on. I was so inspired. It was absolutely an incredible experience. And those who I've talked to, who were there and witnessed that still say to this day that was one of their favorite mass occasions ever. I've heard something similar. Um, how many people are familiar with St. Nicholas de Chardonnay in, Par in Paris, France? They just celebrated the anniversary of the takeover that they did whatever, how many years ago, 30, 40 years ago. People who go there, uh, tourists, American tourists go there, and there's like 2,000 people crammed in this church, and they're all singing. 
they're all singing. The walls are vibrating. They're like, wow, what an experience to hear this, all these Parisians singing um, the various parts of the Mass. So with that little intro there, we're going to move on here to the topic of this. The first thing I want to talk about is the word active participation. That often gets a bad rap in tradition. And to be honest, I started this conference with quote after quote after quote after quote after quote trying to justify that because a lot of times I've debated with people who just are absolutely intransigent when it comes to the idea that there's a, a legitimate form of active participation. They've been so traumatized by what happened in the Novus Ordo or because of their um, maybe pre-Vatican II experience, they can't see it any other way. Um, so active participation should not have a bad word. It should not be a bad word. It was used by St. Pius X himself. Okay, uh, we're gonna talk about in a little bit here. Um, it's a, it is, of course, natural that people have a lot of knee-jerk reactions um, to the idea of what participation is in the Novus Ordo compared to what it is in tradition. Um, that's very understandable. And that's why um, I just want to give one quote here, just one quote, to counter what is the liberal interpretation of active participation versus what St. Pius X, that is the orthodox interpretation of active participation, which is nothing more than really the traditional method of attending Mass. This is how our ancestors attended Mass until a curious set of historical circumstances occurred that caused problems, which we may or may not get into today. Um, so this quote from Pope Pius XII in his incredible encyclical Mediator Day of 1947, quote, the fact, however, that the faithful participate in the Eucharistic sacrifice does not mean that they are also endowed with priestly power. It is very necessary that you make this clear to your flocks, he's speaking to the bishops and the priests, pastors and souls. All of this has the certitude of faith. However, it must also be said that the faithful do offer the divine victim, though in a different sense. I think we can all agree with that. We don't have a problem with that here. Um, okay. The other issue is that oftentimes um, you'll see, if you like in America magazine, that Jesuit piece of you fill in the blank, um, or something else like that, uh, National Catholic Reporter, otherwise known as the Fish Wrap. I really like that. Um, I live right down the street from there, by the way. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, you're going to love this. Their building, the, the Kansas City St. Joseph a Diocese of Chancery, was literally right behind it. Yeah, so here they are attacking you. Yeah, okay, anyway, it's wonderful. Um, but anyway, so uh, you know, they'll accuse the traditional mass as not fostering active, active participation or as if active participation never existed until the publication of Novus Ordo Mise, Deo Gratias. It's like, um, no, um, that's actually not true, not only from history, because we know uh, from the earliest times all the way up, at least to the Reformation and beyond, Catholics did always participate actively at Mass in one way or another. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, St. Pius X tried to restore it, and we know all the other popes of the 20th century tried to restore it for the traditional Mass. So this is a, this is a lie. This is a lie that, that the traditional Mass never fostered active participation. In fact, it fosters the best form of active participation. And in several different ways it can occur, too. Which you can't do in the Novus Ordo, by the way. The, the, as Lisa pointed out, there's only one way you got to go along to get along in the Novus Ordo. That's the only way it's going to happen. There's, there's just no other, no other way to do it, okay? Um, in the traditional mass, you might say you have options, so to speak, okay? Um, so let's talk, for instance, say Pius X, Pius XI, Pius XII, uh, help to restore and encourage a proper sense of active participation amongst the faithful mass in the following ways. So first and foremost, to the restoration of Gloria chant, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, admonitions to the faithful to take a greater part in the sacred liturgy according to their proper roles. So no, you're not the priest trying to do the sacrifice. You're not going to hold your hands out this way during the middle of the consecration. Okay? You can't do that. Um, for instance, reduction of the children's age for admittance to Holy Communion. Uh, the encouragement and spread of the dialogue mass. 
And note we're talking about uh, that this is a traditional method of responding. I know dialogue mask gets bad rap among some people. Uh, I actually wrote two articles to rebut all the false accusations and misconceptions about that form of the low mask, uh, which is up on my website. It was published in The Remnant. Um, and uh, it's interesting enough because my, my first debate was with a gentleman, Dr. Brian McCall, who I am friends with now. That's how we actually ended up becoming friends. And in the end, he ended up saying, you know what, I, I realize now um, the veracity of, of, your, of your rebuttals because he had been misinformed about the dialogue mask. That was the traditional method all the way up until the Reformation. I met at the publicly spoken low masses. Um, and there's, there's plenty of historical proofs to show that. Um, also, uh, the popes tried to promote uh, active participation through the spread of the lay missiles. You know, so um, luckily, some, uh, uh, there's some new ones available. You don't have to go and find some old broken down one anymore and, you know, oh, that page is missing or the binding's gone or half the ribbon's gone. Um, you know, now we have the Roman Catholic daily missile. Baronius Press has their missile. Um, there's some other ones as well that have been reprinted. So um, you really have, it, there's even, you know, the Sunday versions only. If you don't want to chuck up all 60 bucks, you only want to spend 20, okay, you can do that now too. Also even a limited use of the vernacular. And here the caveat was it was limited. And they were orthodox translations and they were mostly concerned with the administration of the sacraments, not the mass itself. There were some concessions that were made, extremely limited. There's not really a problem with that. Like for instance, um, you see this in France actually. They'll, while the priest is actually saying the gospel in Latin, there is another priest who's saying it in French from the pulpit. So that's, that's a, I even know priests in the United States, they end up saying it from English at the pulpit. It's not really supposed to be done that way, but in the circumstances, the way things are, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, that being said, all those translations at that time were orthodox. We didn't have an issue with the ICL or, you know, stupid grammatically incorrect things. Um, so there was a big difference there. And, and, and just to also put it straight too, you know, the, no, the problem with the Novus Ordo Mise is not an issue. They didn't do it just so they could have a better translation or they could make a translation. They did it to make much more revolutionary changes. It was an issue of just saying, hey, let's make the mass in the vernacular. They could have taken one of dozens of good translations out there and just said, okay, that's what we're gonna use. And that's not what they did. So we know it's not, it had nothing to do with that. Okay, so I've just got a few quotes here real quick on why this active participation is important for us, what the popes have had to say. So we'll start out with Pope St. Pius X. And this is his uh, motu proprio on sacred music. So the first step towards restoring the active participation of the faithful to its rightful place was by restoring Gregorian chant. That was really the, that, that was the foundation of everything. And, you, people might ask, well, why did it take so long for that? Well, there were a lot of politics involved. There were even copyright issues involved. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty complicated mass, mess. And it was Pope St. Pius X to finally cut through all the red tape and said, that's it. Salem's method, that's what you're doing. Boom. End of story. Raz Bone, we don't care if you had a copyright on Gregorian chant. It doesn't exist anymore. And it was a tough decision to make. So he says, Quote, being moved with the most ardent desire to see the true Christian spirit flourish again in every way among all the faithful, the first thing to which we must turn our attention is the holiness and dignity of the temple. We talked about that earlier about the veiling. There are people assembled for the purpose of acquiring the Christian spirit from its first and indispensable source, namely the active participation. There it is in Italian, attiva partecipazione in the most sacred mysteries, and in the public and solemn prayer of the church. And to move on, we now have uh, Pope Pius XII again in the after day. It is therefore desirable, venerable brethren, speaking to the bishops, that all the faithful should be aware that to participate in the Eucharistic sacrifice is their chief duty and supreme dignity. It's not only your highest duty, it's not only the highest thing you could do, it's, it's your duty, it's your highest duty. And not in inert and negligent fashion, just, just sitting there, okay? Giving way to distractions and daydreaming, which we, of course we never do. 
<laughs> with such intercept and concentration that they may be united as closely as possible with the high priest, who is the priest at the altar. According to the apostle, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And together with him and through him, let them make their oblation, and in union with him, let them offer up themselves. And we'll talk a little bit further about that offering up. Um, lastly, just as one little proof that active participation is not being something that's a rabbit being pulled out of the hat in the 20th century, um, here you have Pope Pius XI in his encyclical on the liturgy of 1928. From the earliest times, the simple chants which graced the sacred prayers and the liturgy gave a wonderful impulse to the piety of the people. History tells us how in the ancient basilicas were bishops, clergy, and people alternately sang the divine praises. The liturgical chant played no small part in converting many barbarians to Christianity and civilization. It was in the churches that heretics came to understand more fully the meaning of the communion of the saints. It was in the churches that heretics came to understand more fully... Oh, I just said that. Thus the Emperor Valens, an Arian being present at Mass celebrated by St. Basil, was overcome by an extraordinary seizure and fainted. At Milan, St. Ambrose was accused by heretics of attracting the crowds by means of liturgical chants. It was due to these that St. Augustine made up his mind to become a Christian. Remember St. Basil again, we saw that earlier with the veiling of the altar. And in fact, there's a famous quote of St. Augustine where he says, where else but in Rome do we hear the mighty thunderous acclaim of the faithful singing Amen. And he said, like, only in Rome do we, I mean, it's, it's just this thunderous reply to the Pope offering the Mass, for omnia saecula saeculorum. Amen. I mean, you can imagine old St. Peter's Basilica, which got replaced by the same one we have today. Now, imagine how we could convert Catholics back to tradition with an edifying example of authentic, pious worship in which we are all taking an active part according to our proper roles. A lot of times we get the complaint, I went to Little Mass, it was so boring, nobody did anything, you just sat there and they didn't do nothing, right? We'll talk a little bit more about that later, not to put down Little Mass. Or imagine how we could convert non-Catholics. <laughs> I know of stories of people who converted to Catholicism and the, the, the first exposure was Gregorian chant. I know of a story of a postman. He walked into St. Ignatius Retreat Center in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and they were playing Gregorian chant on the loudspeakers for whatever reason. He was their postman. He heard that. He was so intrigued. He had never heard anything like it in his life. Went to look it up. No internet at this time, by the way. No YouTube, no Google search, no Yahoo. And he found recordings at his local record store, started listening to this, started seeing what was in these prayers that these monks were chanting. And this one thing after another, now he's a, now he's a Catholic. I mean, I know stories of priests who either were seminarians or after they were ordained, found tradition through the Gregorian chant. <laughs> they heard this, and they're like, this is sublime. This wasn't on, on eagle's wings. This was, you know, something else. They're like, wow, what is this? This is nothing of this world. And that's what the liturgy is supposed to be. It's supposed to reflect the heavenly liturgy of heaven. Okay? It's supposed to uh, of uh, what we see there. Um, okay, so this conference is not going to be academic. Sorry to disappoint you. Maybe you won't fall asleep. Okay. Um, and I want to point out to you uh, some of the handouts I've given to you. Uh, the first one is that great encyclical Mediatra Day by Pope uh, Pius XII, written in 1947. Uh, I could quote from this extensively, but I'd rather you take it home and read it, soak it up like a sponge, and go over it again and again and again. It really helps to encapsulate the theology and the liturgy. He also um, opposes some of the errors that were creeping up at that time, which made its way, unfortunately, eventually into the conception of the new mass. So uh, specifically like antiquarianism, all right? Um, also of the faithful 
uh, confusing the common priesthood with the royal priesthood, which we just spoke about earlier. Okay, um, so this is an absolutely magnificent encyclical. Every Catholic is serious about the liturgy, and that should be every Catholic, in my opinion, should read this. And uh, there's so much here. That's the first handout. The second handout is a little article called Attendance and Mass and Participation in the Liturgy. It's written by Father Michael Simoline. Uh, he's a French priest. It was published in the Angelus Magazine uh, back in 1997. Um, and it's really great because he goes into a little bit of the theology and the philosophy of what we're going to be talking about today, the postures of Mass, the gestures, the reverences that are going to be made. Um, it really gets into the heart of why it's just one more convincing argument. Why should we want to do this? Why should we do this? Why should we learn it? And the last thing you have, and you have it in black and white, but you're going to see it eventually as a slide in color. It's actually a card I developed. And uh, if you want to convince your pastors to get this to aid you um, with participating <laughs> in mass uh, more properly, um, I'm happy to uh, get them printed out, laminated for you guys. Um, even if the pastor wants, you know, there's a couple little odd and end things that we might have a customary thing to do here. Could we change this or that as long as it's not heretical? Uh, yes, yes, you can do that as well, too. So, um, okay. So, also I want to mention that on my website, like I said, I have those articles uh, under the section articles um, about the dialogue mass. The reason I would suggest that to you, even if you have no opposition to Dialogue Mass, I mean, some people get very heated about this, uh, it contradicts or corrects or clarifies a lot of misconceptions about the liturgy that are made, okay, um, on some very basic things. But they get repeated like a mantra over and over and over again, and people are thinking, oh, this is the way it is, and it's like, so um, I would recommend that to you for that reason. So it's a lot of principles and notions. Uh, to refute various misconceptions that a lot of traditionalists have uh, for one reason or another. Okay, so before we move on, we need to talk about the types or forms of the Mass that exist in the Roman Rite. And this is according to what was defined in the rubrics of uh, the 1962 Missale Romanum, just to give a quick background. In 1960, a new code of rubrics was promulgated, thankfully, that really helped to simplify things. Uh, been, they began the work under Pius XII. It was John XXIII who actually published it. Many of these, uh, the things that you see there with the uh, simplification, rectification, the classification of rubrics gets technical, goes all the way back to the Council of Trent. Many of these things never, never got accomplished uh, that the Council of Trent would like to have seen get done. Um, just to give you a little background, um, so they spent eight years reforming the breviary, in, uh, which was uh, produced in 1568. Eight years. And you're like, why eight years? Because at that time, the calendar that the breviary was following in the Roman Rite did not conform to the calendar used in the Missal of the Roman Rite. So they had to join them back together. Massive amount of work had to be done. They spent, by contrast, only about five years on the Roman Missal. And they nowhere near got anything done that they wanted to. They got the most important things done, so to speak. <laughs> and then, as I say, politics intervened uh, on, on, the, on the secular scale of things and interrupted any further work that could be done. Because if you consider what happened after 1570, um, thanks to the Protestant Re Revolution, and then therefore what happened in society, um, you know, chief of them was the French Revolution, but we had the Hundred Years' War, we, you know, all this stuff, these things convulsing Catholic Europe, uh, heads being rolled, that had crowns on them, all kinds of things. The Pope being, uh, you know, basically uh, the Holy See lost all its properties, the Papal States, you know, and one thing after another hit Holy Mother Church during that time. So they had bigger fish to fry than to really work on, on, on uh, doing any further reforms to the liturgy. Not until you get up to basically Pope Leo the Thirteenth do they kind of start trying to get back to what they had wanted to do. Okay, so the 1960 Code of Rubrics they clarified a few of the terms um, used for the different types of mass. So the first one we have is a Misa Solemnis or Solemn Mass as we call it in English, which is some, and that has uh, three sacred ministers: the celebrant, the deacon, and subdeacon, 
as you see up there in the top, okay? And uh, then, of course, all the additional inferior ministers as well. Then you have what's called the Misa Katata, um, and that is a high mass that's sung with incense, and that's what defines the Misa Katata today. It's true that before 1960, Misa Katata could refer to basically any type of sung mass, not anymore. Misa Katata literally means the high mass that we call today. Um, in, in America, we call it the high mass, which is basically a sung mass with incense, okay? Um, then we have the Misa Lecta or Privata, so the, the said or the private mass, which we call in English low mass, okay? Um, this is recited, as we saw um, this, uh, this afternoon, or this morning, I should say. It can include hymns. It can even include some of the propers, as we saw today, which is quite nice, nice little touch there. It could be dialogued, and it can also include hymns. It can also be sung, but without incense, and include dialogue as well. So there's different varieties of low mass that can be done. The most common one you see, of course, is just the purely reciting one, where just the celebrant and the server are making the responses. Okay. Um, and originally, the low mass was intended to be, a pro they call it Visa Privata because originally it was just a priest and a server off in the side chapel somewhere so he could fulfill his priestly duty. And the development of low mass occurred because we had a multiplication of votive masses uh, in the, um, between the 10th and 11th century. All these votive masses that people wanted said for whatever reason. And many of them are still preserved in the Roman Missal today. Um, and an interesting side note here is because of the form of low mass, the celebrant now had to have all of the things that he needed to pray in one book. Previously, they were divided up into several different books, which is what you see in solemn mass. The scola has theirs, the lever, the deacon has the epistles, the subdeacon has, I'm sorry, the, the deacon has the gospel, the, the, the subdeacon has the epistles, um, the MC has the rubrics, but they're up in his head, he's not walking around carrying something, and the celebrant has uh, his prayers that he says. Um, at low mass, he needed all one convenient volume, which is what led to the Missale Romano, which is a very unique liturgical book. <coughs> Nothing of the kind exists in any of the liturgies of the East. They still have the old-fashioned uh, separated book system, which is if you ever go to like the Byzantine Divine Liturgy, you'll notice that the priest will be switching books constantly. He doesn't just refer off one book. Whereas us, very, very convenient. He just stays with one book. That's it. Okay. Now, added to this, we have pontifical forms. We have the solemn mass of the throne, solemn mass of the falsehood. Now, the falsehood throne is based on jurisdiction and authority. We won't get into that today. And then we have a pontifical low mass form, which is a little more elaborate than what you see a, a regular priest doing. And then there's just a real basic low mass that a bishop would do. It gets a little extra stuff. And by the way, there's papal versions of this too. So uh, it, it gets really uh, technical and everything, but it's very, very interesting. Okay. Now, the first thing we need to understand is that solemn mass is the ideal and the norm. It's, it should be the ideal form and the normal form of the mass that we see. Unfortunately, it's not today. It was before the Protestant Reformation. It was before the convulsions that hit Europe. Almost every single monastery, or religious, major religious order, every cathedral, every collegial church would have a daily solemn mass. In fact, it's still in the rule of St. Benedict. Because they're supposed to have the conventual mass where the whole community comes together is supposed to be a solemn mass, possibly even a pontifical form because the abbot can pontificate in many cases, okay? Um, so all the priests would go off and do their little private masses in the little obsidial chapels or side chapels, and then they would come together for the conventional mass, okay? Even in parishes where there was a multiplication of clergy, it was possible in many cases to have a solemn mass much more frequently than we're accustomed to seeing today. That being said, we also know there was some form of a high mass being done even though it disappeared for a while, and it wasn't until the 19th century that it started kind of coming back again, and then they had to have special permission. Now you no longer need special permission to do a Misa Cantata, okay? You can do it, a priest can do it whenever. Um, so, unfortunately today, solemn mass is rare and few in, in between. But once upon a time, it was actually the only form of mass that was ever used. We know this in the early church that when the bishop gathered on Sunday, all his clergy surrounded him, and he offered what we call pontifical mass today, okay? That, there was no such thing as low mass yet. That didn't happen until about 1000 AD, okay? So what we see here, um, Dr. Adrian Fortescue, as I talked about before, by the way, thank you for returning my books. <laughs> I know it's a temptation to keep some of them. Um, 
quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia, um, this high or solid mass, so in England they call the solid mass high, whereas here in America we call high mass where it's just a celebrant with the, uh, the various extra servers and the incense. This high mass is the norm. It is only in the complete rite with deacon and subdeacon that the ceremonies can be understood. Thus the rubrics of the ordinary of the mass always suppose that the mass is high. So that, that's the first principle we, we really need to work off of, is that it's really the sung mass that's the ideal form or rite of the mass for us as Roman Catholics. Now, interesting is, if you go to the East, there's, there's no spoken version of the mass. It's always sung. It's always sung. There is no such thing as low mass in, in the divine liturgies of the East, which we have our special reasons for what we did. First thing is, many of them don't have daily mass, by the way. They don't have daily mass, what we do. Okay? So the thing is, the trade-off is, yeah, I'd rather us have daily mass. Okay? I, I don't want to get rid of low mass. Low mass has its place in the patrimony and the ritual of the Roman Catholic Church of the Latin Rite. Uh, I'm not advocating for its abolition at all, far be it. Um, that being said, for the public masses, we should always want to prefer a sung mass. Okay? Um, and preferably, of course, the solemn mass, can't do that. The high mass, maybe even a sung low mass, can't do a sung low mass, maybe a dialogue low mass. Okay? Um, because again, you know, the faithful should have some form of participation, which is not just merely following the words in the missal, or what you have interior. And your interior needs to be linked to your exterior, as we're going to talk here in a little bit. All right. So from Pope Pius XII the Midi after day, talking about those who are trying to uh, encourage his active participation. Uh, quote, they are also to be commended who strive to make the liturgy even in an external way a sacred act in which all who are present may share. This can be done in more than one way. When, for instance, the whole congregation in accordance with the rules of the liturgy either answer the priest in an orderly and fitting manner, forcing him suitable to the different parts of the Mass, or do both. Or finally, in high Masses, when they answer the prayers of the minister of Jesus Christ and also sing the liturgical chant. So I think we've seen enough quotes that obviously Gregorian chant uh, as a big part of this participation. Um, and in regards to that, I want to get on a soapbox just for a minute here, give you my two cents worth, about silence. Um, and I'm thankful for uh, Lisa here talking about the silence of the canon. Um, there's silent parts of our mass. This is, what's interesting is in the you, by the way, you go into the east, and there's always the faithful, whatever they're praying is overlapping that of the ministers, except for when the deacon pops out, and then he decides to do some dialogue, and he goes back away. There's this constant overlapping going back and forth. This is the ancient way of actually participating in the liturgy, and of course we see it in the, in the solemn masses too, not to our same extent in the Roman rite as in the eastern rites, but like for instance when we're singing the Sanctus, we're actually overlapping the first part of the canon up until the consecration. Um, when we sing the Agnus Dei, we're overlapping um, the prayer, the priest's prayers of, com of preparation for communion to the actual act of communion itself, so to speak. So there's this beautiful interplay that's going on, you might say, um, between the laity and, and the ministers of the Mass. Now, my soapbox on silence is there's a lot of goodwilled people out there who are talking about silence in regards to, to traditional liturgy versus that of the chaos and noise of the Novus Ordo. And it's perfectly understandable, but at the same point, we must be very careful to make proper distinctions because, again, we've just seen what is the ideal form of Mass. It's singing, and it means overlapping. There are these poignant moments of silence. Consecration is the best part. As Lisa pointed out very well, you cannot miss the consecration in the Roman Mass. It's impossible. Everything stops. And hopefully our kids stop screaming too. I have the same problem. I feel like a, a, a circus trainer. No. It's consecration, it's consecration, it's consecration. Okay. Um, you know, everything stops. It's dead silence. You can hear a pin drop. And then you have this clear ringing of the bell to help announce, here is our Savior. Adore. Awe and adore and worship him. And it's unmistakable. If you go to the, have anybody been to the Byzantine Divine Liturgy and seen their consecration, almost anticlimactic if you're so used to Latin rite, because the priest is saying it out loud. 
He's saying the consecration formula out loud. There's no elevation, of course, because that's a strictly Roman practice, Latin right practice. It's an interesting history how that happened. Um, but, I mean, you literally, you almost miss it. I mean, it's just like, that was it? That was it? I mean, if, if you're used to the Roman, you're kneeling down, dead silence, the world is still. Um, on the other hand, of silence. I want to be very, very careful because I see a lot of people, uh, not for the same reason that Lisa did. Lisa said, maybe go to low mass first to acculate yourself on the order, and that, that's an excellent idea to do that, uh, to get used to the order from A to Z, uh, how it works in traditional mass, because it can be difficult to follow at first, like she said. If you're so accustomed to how the Novus Ordo was, then you, then you come to the, then you go to a high mass, and you're like, wait a minute, I just missed this whole all these pages in my missile. What happened? Well, you were singing while he was doing that. Oh, okay. What, in low mass, though, you're you're following the order as long as you can kind of keep up with the pace of the priest. That it can take a little bit of time to get used to as well. But that being said, we need to be careful about over promoting the low mass because we know what its proper place is. And unfortunately, um, not just in America, but throughout the Roman Catholic world, before Vatican II, there was oftentimes a low mass mentality. You, you may have heard that term before. Where it's just like, let's just quickly say it, get over with, and we're done. Okay? Um, or this idea of, of what we call pietism, which is an error that my private devotions are higher than the social, corporal, liturgical acts. So I'm just going to sit here and do my little if a child of Prague devotion. Well, he's saying Max, but that my infant child of Prague devotion is more important than what he's saying. I actually had someone tell me that, who grew up before Vatican II, and they thought that's how they should participate in Mass. I feel very sorry for that person. Um, and, and it's like, so that, that's the thing you got to be careful of. It's like, you know, I'm just here, he's there, it's me and Jesus, okay, uh, the Protestant idea. Um, we are corporate social beings. We are not Calvinists. We are not Protestants. As the Calvinists came up with this idea that man is not a social creature. Not even the Lutherans would go that far. I mean, they at least had enough sanity to stick with the natural law, the natural order of things, to that degree. It, was, it took someone like John Calvin to become really idiotic, which is eventually what led to modernism, okay? So, um, I would, again, with the, this whole thing on silence, it's really important we're making the proper distinction. Um, and I would go so far, by the way, Gregorian chant is a form of silence. It's a form of contemplation. Really, if you think about it, if you're hearing the Gregorian chant, it's being done well, you're listening, incredibly contemplative. It's prayer on our lips, okay? Um, so, anyways, my two cents worth. All right. So, how to participate. So St. Pius X was fond of saying, quote, don't pray at Holy Mass, but pray the Holy Mass. And Pius XI would say in Divini Cultus, the faithful quote, should not be merely detached and silent spectators, or muted spectators, as some people have uh, translated it from the Italian. So again, you're at the Cubs game and you're doing absolutely nothing if you care less. You're a Cubs fan and you could care less the Cubs are beating the Cardinals? I don't think so. That's just. <laughs> Here we are at the Mass, and it's our Messiah who's triumphantly victorious. And we waited how many thousands of years for him to come and redeem us? You know, let, let's cheer, so to speak. You know, we have our Gregorian chant, we have our responses we can make. We also have the hearts, the mind, and the body. Okay? And so. At low mass, we can we can sing, we can dialogue. On the dialogue mass, by the way, caveat on that. It's really important that there's good pastoral implementation or pastoral training, to use that word, on the dialogue mass. One of the chief complaints I've seen, and I totally agree with this, is where the Latin gets slaughtered, massacred, <laughs> unrecognizable. And we have a lot of, I've seen a lot of good willing pastors, oh, I'm just gonna do a dialogue. And I said, like, Father, do they even know the responses? Oh, I'm sure they do. I'm like, uh, I bet you they don't. And you got kind of about one person's going too slow, one person's going way too fast, and one person who has no clue to how to even pronounce sanctus, or sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. No, it's not sanctus coffee, okay? Um, it's sanctus. Um, so, um, in that regards, I always, I always recommend to people, it's like, look, it, it's really helpful to have a little bit of um, pastoral training outside of the Mass. 
on how this should be done and what is to be expected, the volume of voice, the pace that's going to be used. And in fact, classically, this is what was done when the dialogue mass was first being promoted. And it was being promoted mostly about with small groups like sodalities or amongst the school children. I can tell you at St. Vincent's Academy, we've been doing the dialogue mass now going on 20 years. They do a fantastic job, but it took a little bit of practice. On the other hand, I don't suggest it for the whole parish maybe on Sunday to do. It's not, you know, um, it may, may not work as well for that, that scenario. So in any case, if you can't do it well, don't do it. That's, that's, that's my main thing. If you can't do the dialogue mass well, don't do it. Uh, have a little practice training first, um, because otherwise it, 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 it defeats the very purpose of why you're trying to do it, which is to raise the devotion and the piety of the faithful, all right? Not to be a distraction. And that's the number one complaint I've heard about that. Um, of course, at sung masses, you can not only sing the responses, the kidiyali parts and the dialogue, we'll talk about that a little bit, and the hymns. But more importantly, participation is not just with the voice, which is what the crux of our conference is today. And the unity of our heart, mind, and body also includes conforming our posture and our gestures to the liturgical actions of the Mass. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas, speaking on the moral virtue of religion, the Summa Theologica, uh, to paraphrase, he says, the logical outcome of public religious acts is to honor God not only in mind, but also with the entire body. Now, this was, during his time, lifetime, this was totally understood in practice. Okay? We, we often, unfortunately in this day and age, a lot of people like to make it look like our ancestors back in the Middle Ages were all illiterate and stupid and dumb. And they may have been illiterate, but I tell you, they could usually speak three different languages, and they knew the Mass. And they knew the Psalms, even by heart, in Latin, because they would attend those services regularly. And it's what we call the immersion method today. These people were not dumb. They knew their Mass, they knew their liturgy, and the evidence for that that's most significant are the, the glorious churches carved in stone. Stonemasons knew their theology. Do you think they had the bishop or priest follow them along as they carved their little things? that express the face of the truths of our Catholic faith? No. No, they knew Latin too. I mean, it, in fact, there's even grammatical, in, uh, grammatical uh, um, deficiencies in some of these carvings we know, but they knew it. Um, these people were not stupid, and they did follow the Mass, they did participate the Mass, and uh, um, in fact, we, we know there's evidence, at least, especially in England, um, old women and children, so those who weren't uh, occupied with work maybe during the day, they would regularly attend the divine office. It was publicly chanted in their parish church. This is in the Middle Ages. This is, the high, in one way, the height of the liturgy in one way. So these interior acts of devotion that we make need to be fulfilled or flow over, spill over exteriorly through our posture, our gestures, and our reverences. And these things all have great symbolic significance and even philosophical ones, which Father uh, Simulin covers uh, in his uh, piece that we passed out. Okay. Move on here. Okay. So let's talk about the posture of Mass, starting with standing. Now, this might surprise a lot of you, but standing is the orans, or praying physician par excellence, meaning the most excellent. And this might come surprising because you, well, low mass are always kneeling. But at solid mass, high mass, we're usually standing. And this is because this is how, as, as Lisa said, this is how the Jews pray. This is how Hebrews pray. They pray standing. Okay? This is how the priest offers the mass as a mediator and the sacrificer at the altar. He's standing. He's standing. He's not kneeling. He'll genuflect on occasion, but he doesn't kneel. He stands. And he stands before the altar. He stands before God, offering for us which we unite to him, okay? So, first principle to know is that usually when you're singing, you're standing. And that's not only practical, but symbolic. It, obviously, it's easier to, to, to sing while you're standing, okay? Second is um, we stand usually when the celebrant is standing and praying aloud. So when he's up there at the altar praying aloud, not, not in a subdued tone that's only meant to be heard by the servers maybe, or, uh, or he's saying it soundly like you see in the Roman canon, Okay? Usually we're always standing to show our unity with him. So the perfect example is the collect of the Mass. 
Dominus Nubiscum, et cum spirit tuo, Oremus, he says the collect of the Mass concludes with Pro Omnia Secula Seculorum, Amen. That's a public prayer that the priest is saying on our behalf as mediator or priest to God. Okay? And it's usually done standing. Kneeling, generally a position of piety. So we're not singing um, at low masses, for example. That's why that's the usual deportment at low mass, because we're not singing. All right? Now, if you all of a sudden have a sung mass, dialogue mass, when you sit, stand, and kneel, it can change a little bit. We're not going to go into that really today. And that's optional, by the way. I do like the part of being able to sit during the, the epistle. Kneel during the epistle. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm slightly lazy, okay? I just stand. Right? So I'm going to admit it. Um, so also, it can indicate uh, reverence or supplication. So some examples. We kneel during the consecration out of reverence for this great moment, this great solemn moment. Christ comes down on our altar. We have the miracle of transubstantiation. We also kneel out of contrition, in this case also supplicating God for mercy. A perfect example is during the tract of Ash Wednesday, when they sing this really long verse which starts out with Adiva nos Deus salutaris noster. Help us, O God, our salvation. We're, about, we're starting Lent. We all kneel down while the Scola chants this verse that we're begging God to assist us during this Lenten period of preparation for Easter. And this track will get repeated throughout Lent on burials. And we'll, if it was a sung mass, we'd always be kneeling during that. Um, also, for instance, the collects of the Requiem Mass, we're actually supposed to be kneeling. The celebrant will remain standing because he's, he's singing it out loud. We actually kneel down. And we're kneeling down to supplicate God for suffrage for the holy souls in purgatory. All right? And then, like I said before, it's a usual deportment in low mass. It's just what happened uh, because we're not, we're not actually singing. Sitting. So we sit to, to listen, like the epistle, or to watch a ceremonial action. Uh, during the offertory, we get to sit. Okay? Um, so just... There's various times we get to sit. We also get to sit when the celebrant sits, usually. Okay? Um, alrighty, moving on. Now we're going to talk about gestures. Would it be possible to get some more water? Sure. All right, I'm right now to think about it. Okay, so these are symbolic actions that are made with the hands. So, first one, the greatest and most profound symbolic gesture we have as Roman Catholics is the sign of the cross. It's an incredible, awesome gesture that we have the privilege to make. It's very simple, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, invoking the Holy Trinity, usually with our lips at the same time. And during the liturgy, we see that this is done often to start or end a prayer. Um, so at the end of the Gloria, we, in a sense, seal what we've said, what we've praised God with, with the sign of the cross. Okay. We've also, at the Creed, which is also called the symbolic action or the symbol of faith in, in Latin. Thank you, Father. Um, this is, of course, also sealed with the belief in the Most Holy Trinity. And uh, during the Sanctus, for instance, when we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, where we should actually be signing ourselves at that time as well. Then we also have striking, or well, not streaking the breast, sorry, uh, typo. <laughs> striking the breast, which is a form of contrition, okay, and it's just a matter of, uh, we'll use it at the confidior, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxi, mea culpa, at the agnus dei, miserere uh, nobis, uh, the domini non sum dignus, all right, uh, Lord A, I'm not worthy, okay. Um, that being said, I would like to make a clarification, and that is, I know it's a custom among some in tradition at the elevation to strike the breast and say, Lord, have mercy, Jesus, have mercy. And really this, if we look at what is required of the sacred ministers, which is the most perfect practices of the Roman church, it's disproportionate with that because the church at that time wants us to adore, to worship, not to be contrite, to worship. The contrition comes afterwards in the animacy section where it's asking us that our sacrifice will be found to be made worthy, and then we'll be forgiven our sins. Okay? So just as a point there, um, it's really important that we conform ourselves to the Roman balance of piety, because the church knows best. She gives us the best balance. It's neither lax, 
it's neither too much, okay? Uh, exaggerated, okay? Uh, and so for that, I would say, uh, I know there were some good old sisters that used to teach that regularly to their students, but it's really out of sync with what the liturgical attitude at that exact moment is, which is awe and worship. Um, just, just that two cents worth there. Do as you wish. Reverences. So this is an act of the body that's rendered to show respect. The most common one are the bows. And I just talked about the spirit and balance of Romanitas, which is to be Roman. The two pillars of Romanitas are we, is logic. We do things because they make sense and practicality because they're easy to do, they're simple. Um, you see this especially if you're to compare the Roman Mass to a Byzantine Divine Liturgy. The Byzantine Divine Liturgy, you, you can't get your head around it. You're like, whoa, what is going on? And that's on purpose, by the way. Okay, it's supposed to be like the fluttering of the angel's wings and stuff. It just seems really <laughs> over the top of some sort of fluids. And it, it kind of is very beautiful. It's very, very beautiful. But not to put it down at all. Then you look at the Roman Mass, and you're like, straight, orderly, I mean, it's just like incredible. And that's, that's our sense of Romanitas. That's what makes our mass so beautiful and so unique and, and, and why I love it so much. I, I really do have a great appreciation of the divine liturgies of the East. Um, with that being said, I'm Roman. I'm Roman to the core. I, and I don't wish, I will go to an Eastern Rite liturgy, fine, and I'll watch them even, but I am Roman to the core. Um, vows. So essentially you have three types of vows. You have a simple, modern, profound, just to show you. Simple is just with your head. Moderate head and shoulders, 60 degrees. And profound is about as far as you can go. And to be honest, as lazy, you really won't be making the profound bow. Um, in fact, it's only made a couple times during high mass, and that's like before and after incense in the celebrant or the book of the Gospels. Um, in fact, just as, as a little rubrical insight, um, the profound bow is never supposed to be made when kneeling. And that's actually a direct decree from St. Congregation Rites, because they're like, you're already kneeling. So the lowest bow you ever make is a moderate bow, which is head and, head and shoulders at a 60 degree angle. Um, so uh, anyways, that, that's, that's a principle in the Roman rite. Um, and then we have genuflections. We have single knee and double knee. Single knee is the one we usually make when the, when the blood sacrament's not exposed uh, to public view. And we have a double knee genuflection when it is exposed to, view, to a public view. And just, just to give you a little insight as well, um, the reversions actually do not, or the, or the rubrics, do not consider the blessed sacrament to be, to, even after the consecration, the blessed sacrament is not exposed to you in the pews, except at the elevations and then during the distribution of Holy Communion. So I know in some places they, they've ended up teaching people to, um, after the consecration, make a double knee genuflection if you leave the church or if you come back in after the consecration. No, if you just make a genuflection. In fact, the rubric prescribes the third for if he leaves right after the consecration, he only makes a single knee genuflection. And he's leaving the sanctuary. So just a little tidbit there, the, the distinctions that are made. Um, that's a little more technical. Okay, if you want to get more technical, uh, general principle ceremonies of the Roman Rite for inferior ministers. Long title, I know. Um, it's a book I actually compiled um, before you could not get all these general principles under one volume. Uh, you had to go and consult various different sources, so I thought, why not make it easy for everyone? So it's basically the liturgical rules of the road. Um, even lay people, such as you, can benefit from this because uh, you get to understand not only better what you'd be doing, but what's going on in the sanctuary. Um, you know, why are they bowing at that time? Why are they genuflecting that? Or should they be genuflecting at that time? No, actually not, according to general principles, but whatever. Um, you know, so a lot of different informations in here, and I got people who are even involved with uh, serving in rubrics. They say, you know what, I, I go back to this over and over again, I always find something new. Um, so I love that compliment. Um, I have to say, even I go back to my book, I say, oh, that's right. <laughs> so, um, all right. So what I wanted before we go through this actually, yeah. apparently I did overwrite my old file. Okay, all right. Well, on my old file I had where we show some of the times that we could bow for. So one of the things I love to promote is not only when to sit, stand, and kneel, but also trying to get Roman Catholics 
to follow intelligently what's going on, either being sung or, or being said at the altar. And that is to make the bows and the gestures in conjunction with that. Um, if you go to the Eastern Rites, for instance, this idea of not participating in Mass is completely unfathomable to them. They never lost that sense because they never got dealt the unique historical circumstances that we got dealt with through the Latin Church. Um, so you go to Eastern Rites and they're always signing their, they sign themselves you know, backwards as we do. Um, and they're always bowing and all that kind of stuff. You, they know when they're supposed well, sometimes they're a little exaggerated on that because sometimes they do it just whenever they want to do it. But they do, in a sense, do when it is supposed to be done as well. Okay? Yes, yeah, so people are laughing because you probably had experience with this. Yeah, I was like, okay, why are you doing that? Okay. Um, so in any case, one of the things I love to promote to people is like, you know, when you're in a pews, you can make those bows. Imagine if everybody in the church is bowing at the same time during the sun gloria. Imagine what they would look like. I mean, incredible. We actually are intelligently following the mass. We know what's being said. And it takes some time to gradually get accustomed to that. Oh, this is what I should bow for this and that. Um, I, you know, it's not something you're going to learn overnight. It's not something you're going to learn overnight. I mean, basically, when we're entering a traditional mass, it's like, we're going to this. And we're gradually learning. Uh, give me an example. I really wanted to learn the canon in Latin. I wanted to be able to follow it in Latin. Took me two months of solid attending daily low mass before I could say the Latin fast enough to keep up with the priest. And I'm not saying the priest is going fast. I just couldn't keep up with him because I was pronouncing it slower because I was still learning my pronunciation of Latin. But I really, really wanted that. Uh, story up, we had, he died just a few couple years ago. He was 97 years old. His name was Mr. Richard Slattery. We called him the Angel's Altar Boy. Because literally he was serving Mass up until 97. This man had the entire canon memorized. And if you sat next to him in the pew, you even knew when the signs of the cross needed to be made. And all the different gestures. Because he'd be in the pews doing all this. I'm not kidding you. He'd do it when he was serving. And one priest had to turn around because he could hear him trying to say the canon. While he was saying the canon... Would you let me say the Mass? Uh, I know, Joe. But the, the, the testimony to this man who just loved the Mass. Just loved the Mass. Um, so, in any case, uh, just, uh, it will take some time to get acclimated to all this, but I do try to encourage people, if you can learn when to make the vows in the Mass, you know, at the various times. Again, that book will help you, General Principles. Do it. For the love of the liturgy, do it. For the love of the Mass, for the love of Christ, do it. Um, so some of the words, you'll recognize some of these, unfortunately they're not on there, they would, nor, they would have been. Uh, Oremus, let us pray. The holy name of Jesus. The uh, name of the Blessed Virgin Mary, when we're referring to her, not like Mary Cleophas or Mary Magdalene. Uh, the name of the saint of the day, okay, during their mass. Um, the Gloria Patria, that beautiful doxology, Gloria Patria Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Um, the Gloria, which in itself is called the major doxology. So there are, there are different words, certainly Lord, like adoramus te, um, gracias a Jesus TV, okay, Jesu Christe. Those are simple words to understand what we're bowing for, to adore him, to give him great thanks, the name of Jesus. During the glory at certain times, the name of Jesus, um, at, when, for the Holy Ghost, simo adorator, likewise we adore, okay? And then like, there's even a, there's times during the liturgy where someone may bow to you and you bow back, and that would be the fervor comes over to incense you. It's this great moment where we show this unity of charity through the, uh, you might say, through the, the incensing of the various persons, various ranks of persons. Then we go to genuflecting. Now, genu both genuflecting and bowing, by the way, are regulated by the rubrics. In fact, there's a famous quote by another rubrician that says, a genuflection or bow should not be made unless it's prescribed by the rubrics. Again, we go back to the spirit and balance of Romanitas. You know, we want to do things because they make sense and because it's, it's practical as well. So I would just give a few little things here, um, just about like, so for instance, you'd make a genuflection when you enter the church and come into the view of the Blessed Sacrament. Likewise, when you leave the church, or leave the view of the Blessed Sacrament. And I say leave the view because there could be a possibility where you're in a really big church and you're going to go to another chapel, you're actually going to be leaving the view of the Blessed Sacrament. Okay, or maybe the Blessed Sacrament is actually in its own chapel, and you're going to leave that chapel. Okay? 
Otherwise, you would normally just bow to the altar by itself. Um, and the altar is bowed to because it symbolizes Christ. Okay, good. We, we were listening to the last conference. Yes, so it's just, just a bow and uh, to the altar for that purpose. During the liturgy, though, we always do to the altar, even if the plus factor is not on it. The, the priest is excluded because he is um, the celebrant. Uh, but even the deacon and subdeacon have to have to genuflect. Um, you'd also, of course, genuflect if you're crossing the center of the blessed sacrament or the center of the altar, or you bow to the center of the altar outside of the liturgical function. That being said, there is no requirement, and it's not even really a great practice, if you have to if you're leaving the pew and you genuflect, go back a few pews behind without ever crossing the center of the altar. Genuflect again and go in. You didn't leave the church. You're just going from one pew to the other. I mean, if you're crossing the center from one pew to another, okay, that would, that would be a perfect reason to do it, of course. But if you're just going from one pew to the next on the same side, you don't, have, you don't need to multiply your genuflections. Um, and in fact, again, again, it doesn't really conform to the Romanitas. We genuflect because there's a reason for it. It's logical. It makes sense. Um, lastly, of course, we, uh, we genuflect during the creed and last gospel at the uh, phrase about our Lord's incarnation. This is a specific practice that came from the Franciscans because of St. Francis of Assisi's great love of our Lord's the meekness and the humanity of his incarnation, okay, uh, of his humility. And so the Franciscans began, when they offered the, the Mass, to genuflect at these points, and then they began copying missiles, and then they began putting it in there, and then that kind of just caught like wildfire inside the Roman Mass, and that's why we do it to this day. So you can thank St. Francis of Assisi for that. Okay. All right. Now we're going to uh, talk about the principles of posture of Mass, and we got through all the academic stuff. So I don't remember the name of the movie, but there's that famous movie with uh, Robert De Niro, who's the Catholic priest. Uh, actually, sorry, it's a different movie. Uh, it's, it's actually called Sleepers. It's not a movie I normally recommend to people. <laughs> but there's a beginning scene, if you know what I'm talking about. They're in the church back in the good old 1950s or whatever it was, and the sisters are behind, and they probably have rulers in their hands. And the girls on one side, boys on the other. And the sister's supposed to knock on the pew and tell them to stand and when to kneel. And one of the boys decides to pull a prank, and he gets everyone to stand, and everyone sit, everyone to kneel, everyone sit, and everyone kneel. And um, the priest walks in, who is uh, Robert De Niro, and he looks at them. He doesn't chastise them. He just looks at them. He says, give me that clicker. Give me that clicker. So he starts to do it to have a little fun. Okay? The point I'm trying to make is we should know why we sit, stand, or kneel. It shouldn't be Simon Says. And that Simon Says game, by the way, is a Protestant invention to make fun of the Catholics. You just do whatever the Pope says, and you don't think for yourself. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, same same error as hocus pocus. Uh, if you want to know what hocus pocus means, hocus stadium corpus meum. The hokey pokey, by the way, you need to turn yourself about. It's the dominus pubisco. Yeah, that's it. And you get down on your left knee, you get down on your right knee, it's a genuine It's making fun of the Catholic mass, is what it is. Okay? It's pure and simple. So. All right. You can still do the chicken dance, though. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing overtly anti-Catholic in that. Okay? Yes. All right. So, the, the rubrics for sitting, standing, and kneeling uh, are, for the clergy and choir, are in the ceremonial Ali Episcopal. My little black book I got to show you, did you pass around and thankfully you did return? Or was that to hunt you down? So... That is for the clergy that are participating in choir. What I mean by choir, those who are sitting in the chancel stalls, you know, either in front of the sanctuary or maybe even behind uh, the altar in some, in some churches, all right? Um, so that strictly applies to them. That being said, some people say, well, there's really no rules for the laity. It's like, well, that's not exactly true because they've always said that the, the rules for the clergy and choir basically apply to the faithful. And as you'll read in Father Simulin's piece, maybe after day and other things, it only makes sense that the faithful should be following something. We're not supposed to be just muted spectators. We're not supposed to be inert. We're supposed to be doing something. So we need some kind of guideline, and it is based on philosophical and theological principles. Okay? Um, unfortunately, this wasn't always practiced before Vatican II. Um, like I said, there was kind of a low-mass mentality. Um, this has been kind of furthered by the fact that we have the... Um, 
I heard one person call it the infamous Red Book of the Ecclesia Dei Coalition, which is a very good effort to try to put in the hands of the faithful as cheaply as possible a little guide for people to follow Mass. You know what I'm talking about, the little missalette? Have you ever seen it? Uh, unfortunately, the rules for seeing state kneeling there are not generally correct. In fact, the lady herself who put it together said, well, I kind of put it together based off memory and what some people told me. She didn't actually research it. And she admitted that. She said, I just thought this was good. You know, I just wanted to put something together. Um, it should also be mentioned that sometimes there is a disparity of what's happening in the sanctuary versus what's happening for the clergy and choir and the faithful of the pews. I'll give you a perfect example is during the asparagus. So during the asparagus, the rite is sprinkling with holy water. The priest is actually required by the rubrics to kneel down while he's sprinkling the altar and anointing himself with the holy water. How everyone else is required to stand, except for the servers who are united with him. So there's a distinct. Otherwise, normally we would kneel when he kneels, stand when he stands, etc. There's some exceptions. Like I said, it, you know, uh, we're, we're going to go through some of that. Um, okay. So general rules. We already talked about the stand uh, when the priest is saying something aloud or when singing. We sit if the priest is sitting. Uh, to kneel for the consecration for a word of praise requires it during the propers, the remainder of the canon, the communion time, and during uh, the last blessing as an example. Okay. So I, you have in front of you uh, the solemn high mass assistant rules, low mass assistant rules. This is a little card I came up with. Unfortunately, you have it just in black and white, and it's very small. Um, so hopefully you can read it. So I just kind of want to go through this with you, and I'll give some pointers about each part of the mass. And I want to make one little caveat here. Please take this home, look at it, study it, but don't be Mr. Zealous. Go to your parish and try to be the first person to get everybody in the church to do this. Okay? Speak to your pastor first. The priest involved. He might have bigger fish to fry than dealing with, well, what's our pastor going to be at mass right now? And unfortunately, this thing about what the posture should be can get controversial with some people. Some people get up in arms. They, they think that they should just be kneeling the whole time. Or, you know, we should be, uh, the most common one you hear is, well, as soon as you hear that sanctus bell ring, get your knees. No, you're not supposed to do that, actually. Um, so people get up in arms about that if you're suddenly not doing it, okay? I tell you over at St. Vincent's, I worked very, very hard to get most of these rules <coughs> into place, which were, I would say, 95% we're following now couple little exceptions, uh, but uh, it took some time, and the pastor was behind it. Uh, but, you know, so like I said, it's, no one's going to go to hell over this, <laughs> so, you know, you don't, don't look at it like that, but at the same time, it's an ideal that we can try to get implemented, but again, some, once again, caveat, big, I did not give, do not say, well, Louis Tafori said, when I get back here, I can, no, I did not, I did not give you a stamp of permission, I did not give you an imprimatur, Nikhil Upstadt, <laughs> No, okay? I will deny all culpability, okay? Uh, I'll deny I was even here. No, no. sorry, Facebook caught this, so I can't uh, do that. Okay, but no, big, big huge caveat. It's really, really important that, um, especially in the context of the traditional Latin mass communities, there's as much unity as possible. I, I always tell priests to the best way to implement um, the ideal form of your deportment at mass is explain it to them from the pulpit. Take your sermon, explain it. So it's not a big giant surprise when suddenly you appoint Mr. Usher to be the clicker guy to tell everyone to sit, stand, kneel. And that way they also have an intelligent idea of what they're doing. I, I'm a real big fan of that because there was too much before Vatican II where people just said, well, Father Holier Than Thou told us, or Sister Mary uh, Holiness told us, but they never told you why. They never told you why. They just said, just do it. And it's like, to me, it's like, we Catholics should know better. We should know our faith. It's like that scene in Brideshead Revisited. When they're trying to explain to Charles, who's the agnostic, he's not a Catholic, and none of them can sufficiently explain why last rites need to be given to the dying father, the patriarch of the family. Nobody, and they're all Catholics. And he said, I always heard Catholics at least knew what they believed in. And he was like, this is abysmal. You guys can't even tell me what's so important about having a priest for Lord Marchman. What is so important? You know, again, I mean, 
you know, I would almost get a little critique there. This is why the English bishops did not really like that book because it didn't paint, paint the nice little, pure little picture of Catholic families that they wanted. It painted a picture of reality, of, I'm sorry, sanctity can come out of broken families. Holiness can come from anywhere. We know that. Christ himself showed it. Look what he did to Mary Magdalene, for heaven's sakes. Look what he did with his dumb apostles. He made them the bishops of the church. They, that, sorry, they were. They, how many times they groaned, I can't believe you still don't understand this. What do I have to do, hit you with a mallet? I mean, they're the first ones to leave him, for heaven's sake. That was the first act of collegiality, by the way, when they all fled him at the agony in the garden. I mean, seriously. I mean, St. Peter, Pope of the Church, denies our Lord three times, one of them at least in front of his face from what we know. I mean, so, you know, again, I just think we should be intelligent in what we're doing as Catholics. We should learn as much as we can. I'm going to go into that more for a minute. Okay, done with my soapbox. Okay. Thanks, Mark. All right. So first thing about the processional, we all stand at attention, so to speak, as the uh, ministers process in. And just a quick word, I've seen this in some places, there is not only no need, no requirement, and in fact it shouldn't be done at all, people turning and bowing to the crucifix or to the priest or anything, that's not done at all. The only time you would ever bow to some of to the priest is if he bow to you, which doesn't happen to the laity, generally speaking. He would uh, sometimes bow to the clergy on both sides. They would bow back. It's kind of a polite little thing like, thank you, you're welcome, okay? Um, but there's there's no, the processional cross doesn't get bowed to in mass at all, except by the ministers before they process, process out and at the end of the processional, but that's a completely different thing. Um, so during the asparagus, the first thing you might be interested to in know is the asparagus, thank you, Mark, is a rite of preparation, of purification. It's there to remind us of our baptism, particularly on Sunday, because it was on Sunday that our Lord's resurrection occurred. And it goes back to the Easter Vigil, when we have the renewal of our baptismal promises and of sprinkling with the Easter water. So uh, the full rite would be that he would actually bless the holy water right there in front of everybody, then take some of the holy water and sprinkle everybody with it. You never see that done, but that's how it actually is in the Missal. And the idea also is renewing the water after seven days, because in olden times, water would go stale after a certain amount of time, so they would refresh the holy water in the church every seven days, all right? Now, we were, so when you're entering the church, by the way, before Sunday Mass, and you know there's going to be asparagus, there's no need to take holy water at the font, because you're going to get sprinkled with it. That's, that's why it exists. The only reason the holy water is in the font is because you don't have an asparagus, okay? Also, during the asparagus, when we're, getting, we're, we're standing while even the priest is kneeling, we stand during the entire rite of the asparagus. Um, you do sign yourself when you get sprinkled, but you should not genuflect or kneel. And the reason is, do you genuflect or kneel when you take holy water at the holy water font when you enter the church? Yeah. Participate. Participate. Do you take holy water? Do you do you kneel or genuflect when you take holy water when you enter a church? No. 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 I hope you don't. I have seen someone do that. Okay. Um, no. And so it's the same thing. The priest is simply sprinkling you with holy water. That's it. He's not giving you a solemn blessing of the sort. Okay. It's a, it's a different type of a blessing, you might say. All right. Um, we should also remain standing when the vesture is being changed, sedilia, after the asparagus, not sitting down. And the reason is because actually the vesting of the, of the ministers is actually considered to be uh, a sacred action, okay, an important action. All right. Um, a difference to that would possibly be um, if the bishop is sitting during a certain part and being vested. Uh, but he stands too during part of it as well. In fact, the rubrics prescribe that everyone have to, has to stand <laughs> when he is vesting. And the ministers in the sanctuary actually kneel when he's washing his hands. Kind of interesting. Um, okay, then we go to the preparatory prayers at the foot of the altar. Now, at some mass, which is what we're talking about, solemn high mass, the introit's being sung. Now, it's true we would kneel down, at the prayers at the foot of the altar. But really it's best to follow your missal, or even better, in a lever, so you can see the chant. Because that chant notation actually means something. It's symbolic. It's not just arbitrary. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example is on um, Low Sunday, Dominica in Albis, also called Quasimodo Sunday. The introit talks about the laughter of the children. And the Alleluia is actually ah, 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 ah like the laughter of a child. 
it, it, that it's like that on purpose. Okay, just just one little neat thing about how the chant works. Okay, um, it's better to follow the, to follow the introit at this time because it's the only time you're going to hear it, technically speaking. Because when the priest goes up to say the introit, he's saying it in a subdued tone only those in the sanctuary can hear. Um, whereas you are actually listening to the chant. The introit was originally intended as an entrance hymn. The only time it's absolutely required to use it as an entrance hymn today is on Holy Thursday. Um, but like you go to the monasteries and a lot of times they will use it as an entrance hymn. Okay? Um, after we're done with the prayers at the foot of the altar, the, 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 the celebrant will actually ascend to the altar and that's when we stand. Because now he's going to the altar and we're going to stand in union with him. Um, interesting to thing to notice is that Solomon High Mass, you now see him for the very first time approaching the altar only after he's made his act of contrition, of preparation. Then he steps up into the Holy of Holies, as he puts it, as he says that prayer, offer a nobis, and then he kisses the altar, this great symbol of reverence, of piety towards Christ, the altar, and the saints contained within. And then he continues that reverence or veneration of the altar by now incensing it, which is another form of preparation and purification because the, 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 you have the good odor of Christ coming out of the incense and the incense rising up to heaven, the smoke of the incense represents our prayers of the faithful rising up to heaven, which is what is happening from the stone of sacrifice. It's also an altar of incense. The prayers from the altar at the, offered at the altar now rise up to God Almighty and are, are deemed acceptable because they're offered through Jesus Christ. So we see this great symbol through the incense. Um, at, okay, moving on, we're now standing during the Kidie. We would be alternating that with the Scola. So they would start by saying the first Kidie Eleison, we would say the second Kidie Eleison, they say the third Kidie Eleison, we sing the first Kidie Eleison, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's really the better way of doing it, is alternating with the Scola. I know in some places everyone ends up singing all the lines, which is all right as well, too. Um, but just so you know, the, the more. The, the method that's it's, it's presumed everyone's going to alternate. Okay, that's, that's what's presumed. Um, certain parishes might not be capable of quite doing that quite yet. The glory is going to be exactly the same. The difference here is again, we can make vows when he intones glory in Excelsis Deo and continue to make the vows as we're following now the scola because he says the rest of the glory in a subdued tone, which we're not supposed to be able to hear. So now we're actually singing the Gloria with the Scola, and we'd make the various vows that would go with that. And of course, at the very end, we would sign ourselves with the symbol of faith. At this point, too, some there are things can happen. Sometimes the Kidie might be very long, the Gloria might be very long, and the, the celebrant may want to sit down at the sedilia or the bench. And at that point, if he sits, we can sit as well. In some countries, actually, they remain standing. The faithful will just keep on standing and singing. That was kind of used to be the custom in England, but it is a lot of course to say that's that's typically our custom here in America. Um, we will stand when the celebrant stands again. So here's another thing too: is uh, you know we're following the celebrant and we're showing the dignity and the honor that belongs to the celebrant as the priest. So when he stands, we stand. We don't wait till he gets to the altar, kisses the altar, and turns around and says Dominus Episcopum. Then we all stand. We're already standing in preparation and waiting for him to greet us liturgical greeting, so to speak. All right. So it shows the precedence that exists as well, too. All right. Uh, the priest versus the faithful. And the clergy are following the same exact rules, by the way, and so are the servers. We're almost done here. Okay. We have the collect. Again, you could bow for the holy name there. The same as of Our Lady, the same as the day. Um, if Jesus Christ is mentioned at the end of the conclusion. And then we have the epistle. During the epistle, generally, we would sit. And the reason because at this point, even though the priest is reading it, he's taking over for the subdeacon. And the sub and so he would normally sit as a subdeacon chants. So we, we act like the subdeacon's there, even though he's not. Um, he'll also sit down at the gradual track all the Hallelujah sequence, whatever number of combinations may occur between the epistle and gospel that are sung. Uh, if they're lengthy, uh, he'll sit down for that as well, and we can sit for that. And during the gospel, we're all going to stand. We're going to stand in honor of the divine word, the divine logos, who has come to 
convert us with the good news, the gospel. And here even the celebrant stands at solemn mass and faces the deacon who's chanting it as his office. All right? Okay, if you go to the next page, we have the sermon. <coughs> now, the sermon, again, again, we should wait to sit down until he's reached the pulpit. And then, of course, once the sermon is finished, um, we'll stand immediately as he returns back to the altar. So again, um, during the creed, we will stand during that again. You can bow as his credo in an deum. Um, in this particular case, the custom has become to not genuflect as a celebrant's genuflecting at the altar, as he says it. Uh, Samisa Voce, but to do it as it's being sung by the scola. And in fact, it's typical in America now that we're all kneeling at that, and the, the priest will actually join us for that. Okay? Technically speaking, that's only required twice a year. That's on Christmas Day and the Feast of the Annunciation, where we'd have to kneel down during the sung credo, credo, but it's become the custom in America, so I just tell people, you know, that's what we're doing, let's just do it. Uh, you know, we get these priests to come over from France and they want to do something else. I'm like, no, that's not what we do here. Don't confuse the people, please. Just, just kneel down when we kneel down, okay? Uh, so, um, there's some other times. So, again, marked on here is um, when we can uh, we kneel and bow at the words that Omo Fakta says. We stand uh, at the crucifix of Itziam. Um, can bow at the words Simul Adorator in reference to the Holy Ghost. And after the cradle, we'll stand again as the celebrant returns to the altar now to say the offertory antiphon. And we remain, we, we remain standing until he says Oremus, and once he said that, we can now sit because the rest of the offertory antiphon he does not say out loud. He says in submissive voce again. Um, so during the offertory, we get to sit and watch what's going on at the altar. Um, and it's nice to be able to sit because that way it gives everyone kind of a chance to see what's going on uh, at the altar. A lot of different things going on. We don't have that much time. When we get up now to the uh, Sanctus, it's become the general practice in America now that, at, that once the celebrants gain incense, we all stand. Um, the official rubrics are once they come to you, you would stand, and then remain standing until the very end of the Sanctus. Song, but, so that's neither here nor there. So, I mean, there's different ways that that can be done. There are some little options here and there. The main thing is, as soon as you hear that Sanctus bell ring, don't hit your, belly, don't hit your knees. Supposed to wait till sung completely. We even sign ourselves during the sung sanctus, not while the priest is saying it at the altur. Because again, he's doing some misavoche. We can't even, we're not even supposed to be able to hear what he's saying because we're overlapping it with our singing. So we should be actually signing ourselves as we sing Benedictus Quidetti to Nomini Domini um, because we're actually singing it. So we should be, of course, expressing it at the same time. Then we would kneel down for the consecration action um, and adore our Lord at the elevations. Interesting note, in the rubrics, it's still in the rubrics, it's still mentioned by the rubricians, almost never ever practiced anymore, or at least today, um, was that after the consecration, we're actually supposed to stand, not stay kneeling. Because we were supposed to show our unity with the celebrant who was saying the animesis, or the remembrance prayer, to show our unity with him in that. The only time we were actually supposed to stay kneeling after the consecration was for masses in violet on burials, and requiems to show supplication and contrition. Nowadays, everyone just stays kneeling, so just say, I mean, unless your pastor gives you explicit permission, just, just that's what everybody's doing. I'm just saying, you know, it is the custom now, but uh, it's just an interesting note to make there. Um, I want to make also, go back to the consecration quick. look at our Lord. St. Pius X had to kind of counteract a Jansenistic uh, opinion which is, oh, we're not worthy to look at our Lord. We should just bow our heads and not look. And he said, no, look and get an indulgence, by the way. So that's what he did. He coupled it with an indulgence. So you look at our Lord and you say, my Lord and my God, Dominus Meus, Deus Meus, if you want to say it in Latin. And you echo the words of St. Thomas, uh, Thomas the Apostle. You know, and and should, should make an act of belief um, there. Get additional graces, so to speak. Okay. Once the celebrant breaks the silence of the canon with the pot and all stare, we stand. From the secula, secula, oro, stand. Oh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I was going to play Simon Says here, but I guess that doesn't work. 
Um, and then we'll remain standing. And we're actually even standing during the fraction or the embolism. But we won't kneel again until after we're done singing the Anya's Day. And of course, during the Anya's Day, you can strike your breast for each time. And a requiem is slightly different because uh, you're singing Dona Hayes Pachis, which you would not strike your breast for because you're singing a Grantham Peace, um, which is something different. And that's on the card as well, of course. After the Anya's Day, we're going to kneel down, and that's when uh, the Anya's Day, the pot, from the Potter Noster all the way up, that is really part of our preparation for Holy Communion. The Anya's Day is special. Uh, I want to mention the historical reason for that chant on his day. Um, they used to have to do, um, they had larger hosts back then, they're slightly thicker, almost like a pizza crust. Um, and um, they, they would have to fraction them. They, had little, they didn't have the little hosts like we have today. They would fraction them for communion. Well, this, this type of fraction took a long time. And during the papal liturgy, especially, and so what Pope Sergius the first did, he introduced the Agnus Day chant. And they would literally just sing Agnus Day Quatos Begat the Mundi over and 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 over again until the fraction was done. Once we got to a more simplified form of the fraction that we have today, which is the simplest ever, um, I can show it to you in all two minutes, uh, compared to the Eastern Rites, which takes about 10, okay, um, using a little golden spear and everything like that, all right, very complex, very complex. Um, they then shorten the audio stage to just three times, being sung, and then of course the very last ending, uh, Donatis Pachis. Okay, then um, again, during uh, the preparation for communion, we'll have the Domini Non Sundinus, and in some places it's actually the custom for everyone to say it. I think it's very beautiful. It is what it is you really saying to our Lord, Lord, I am not worthy to come underneath to, to receive thee, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Okay. Um, but main thing is to look at our Lord, because he's saying, Ecce Agnus Dei, Ecce Quintilis Picata Mundi. So he's echoing the words of St. John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who you are about to receive. All right. Um, during communion, of course, we're kneeling out of reverence for our Lord, who's now exposed to everyone, especially if you've received Holy Communion. Uh, during the ablutions, which is the washing out of the chalice, or purification of the chalice with the water and the wine after communion, um, if you receive communion, you really should remain kneeling because that's part of your thanksgiving. Um, but if you have it, you can actually sit. You can sit if you haven't received. Okay. Um, and then finally, we have the post-communion part. Um, we're all going to stand uh, when the, the priest starts Oremus. Okay. And he'll read now what's called the, the post-communion prayer, all right, which is a, a collect. It's a form of a collect, okay? Um, again, there's very different times of the bow for that during the Oremus. If the name of Jesus is mentioned, the name of the saint is mentioned, etc. And, of course, when you open the last blessing, no education needed for that. And during the last gospel, we're standing, and we genuflect at the phrase for uh, the incarnation of our Lord. And then lastly, during the recessional, we'll stand, again, just like for the procession. Right. Now, for low mass, if you want to go back to the front sheet, the only real points you need to make is basically you're kneeling throughout the mass. You can sit for the, for the epistle, you will stand for the gospel, you will stand for the last gospel, so it's the same rule for both gospels. But the, one, the one major thing I want to make mention of is the better practice in getting ready. So we're sitting down during the offertory, just as high mass. And the better practice is when he said Fromia Sicula Siculorum, we stand up, he goes to the preface, he says the Sanctus, of course we sign ourselves, he finishes with the Sanctus, then we kneel. And imagine, you guys have experienced this, sure, when you all see you ring this, you hear the Sanctus bell ring and everyone hits their knee, here's the most awesome opening into the canon of the Mass that's completely obscured by what? Noise, clanging kneelers and people all shuffling to get into place and everything. Instead of that being a moment of reflective contemplation of us echoing the words of the angels in heaven. And we're entering into the most sacred part of the mass, the ancient Roman canon. So, you know, again, just uh, cry out there about that, about that part. Okay? I'm pretty much other than that, it's, it's just real basic for low mass. Okay? If it's a dialogue mass, um, there's certain, you know, some people say you can stand during the creed, fine. If it's a sun low mass, 
Um, if you're going to be singing like the Kitty Alley parts, like the Kitty A, the Gloria, the Cradle, the Song of Daniel's Day, it's better to be standing for those parts. Okay, like you would at a regular high mass. So then you just simply apply that. All right? Um, so I got a few last words here. That kind of clear to everybody? I didn't lose anybody. Nobody fell asleep on me. All right. Uh, so the last thing about participating in Mass, one of the most profound ways you can participate in Mass is by going to Holy Communion. And in relation to that, take the time to make a good Thanksgiving. Five minutes is ideal. Uh, there's the famous example of St. Philip Neri who had two acolytes accompany a man who had just received communion, leaving the church too early, and they were carrying candles, and he followed them down the street. He's like, what are you doing? And he said, well, you, you left too early, and you just received our Lord. And the man finally got the point, what he had just received. Okay. So just real quick, a couple other two cents worth stuff. Uh, here's some common uh, objections here. I don't know how to sing. I don't know Latin and other lame excuses. So, first thing I say is, we study and practice what we love. I find it amazing when people are willing to spend hours studying, watching, or trying to learn, which isn't really that important. And I want to focus on men, just for a second here. Women are, are naturally, uh, naturally like to sing, they're naturally pious. We men have to work a little harder at it, especially we Americans. And I'm amazed by Catholic men. Maybe you not you men, okay? But I've seen this in other places. By the Catholic guys who can spout all kinds of sports statistics and know this game inside and out, which I can't figure out for the life of me, but don't have a clue about their sacred liturgy. Don't have a clue when they should sit stand or kneel. Don't have a clue how to sing any of the Gregorian chants, which aren't terribly difficult to learn. Okay? Um, Pius XII said, Thus the liturgical year should be considered as a splendid hymn of praise, offered to the Heavenly Father by the Christian family through Jesus, their perpetual mediator. Nevertheless, it requires a diligent and well-ordered study on our part to be able to know and praise our Redeemer ever more and more. It requires a serious effort and constant practice to imitate his mysteries, to enter willingly upon his path of sorrow, and thus finally share his glory and eternal happiness." Unquote. A few shout outs there. First, and I just direct it to men, but everybody, learn how to sing the Mass. Uh, if the Mass is important to you, then learn these things. These are a great chance of victory. It's like going to the Cubs World Series and not singing the National Anthem. Who would think of that? Uh, you know, we're singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game at the seventh inning, and even though Harry Carey's not even there anymore. Okay? The basic responses is Amen and Ecum Spiritu too. Oh, they're just too easy to learn. They really are. They don't take any effort. There's tons of YouTube videos out there. Some with the Gregorian chant notation. The Korean chants are really easy to, to, to read and learn. I mean, you don't have to be a sight reader for heaven's sakes. You can memorize it. In fact, I can't sight read. I can't. I memorize my music. I was studying nutritional mass when I was 22, found it, and I learned how to sing the Kiriale parts. Just like that. I wanted to learn. I would listen and I try to memorize it. I, have, I happen to have a good memory, okay? At least I think I do. My wife says I'm forgetting stuff all the time, but. Um, shopping lists and stuff like that, but uh, yeah, anyway, you know, important things, all right. Um, so, you know, it, it's the, the, all those materials and resources are out there if you really want to take the time to do it. It's really important to you. Posture and gestures, again, you have a copy of the card if you want to learn. You can get the general principles book if you want to. Uh, for those people who say, I don't know Latin, you don't need to be a linguist. Tell you what, I'm not fluent in Latin. I'll be the first one to admit it. I can read it, though. I can open up the missile and I know what they're saying. I can't conjugate it, I cannot decline it, and I'm not going to grammatically dissect it for you. I could care less about that. I want to be able to read it. And I know what they're saying, and as Dr. Uh, uh, um, doc, uh, doc, oh, um, Kasson? No. I have a question. So, 
Keep clapping. Music director, okay. Yeah. Made a really good point. You get the sense of what they're being said. They get the sense of what's being said. He does not, he said, I don't understand every single word of the Times of America, but I know the sense of what they're saying. You can do the same thing too. Okay? At one time I actually could speak Latin a little fluently, but you know, little gray cells, you know, they disappear over time, especially for kids and stuff, and you don't have to put it into practice, so it goes away. That being said, I can pick up a missile, I can understand what it is. I can close the missile, and if I can hear the priest, and he's saying the Latin uh, co coherently, clearly, I can actually understand what he's saying. The epistles could be a little hard. That's St. Paul. St. Paul is just way up there, okay? Even in English, okay? So that's why we need commentaries. But you get the basic gist, okay? You don't need to be a linguist in Latin to learn Latin. Learn, you can learn a few little words here and there. And, and, and by the way, what we use in liturgical Latin gets repeated over and over and over and over again. So there's nothing really new there. Knowledge of the Mass, Texts, and Prayers. We already talked about, uh, you know, you can get a missile, okay? Study the ordinary in the canon of the Mass. Maybe even endeavor to try to learn it in Latin. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to read the canon in Latin. It's beautiful. I almost never want to go back to English after I do it in Latin. Okay, once in a while I do. Okay, um, use a missile. Um, study the proffers before ma before mass or, or the night before, especially if you have little kids that you know you're going to be taken care of. If you had a chance to read the Epistle of the Gospel and the various proffers like the Intro, the Gradual, and the Alula, you already have a sense of what's going on before you have to become the circus trainer. And you can still follow the mass coherently while you're taming your little lions. Lastly, learn more about the mass. Uh, my radio show, Learning About the Roman Liturgy. My motto is, you can never stop learning about the liturgy. I will never stop learning about the liturgy. Okay? There is too much to know. And you can never stop learning. There's just, it's just impossible. There's so much. The, the liturgy is this big, giant, inexhaustible treasure trust of the Catholic Church. There's so much you can learn. And I, I really, really encourage you, please, get, fill up your library with, with liturgy books. It's not just for the clergy. It's for your laity, too. The you know, laity have had a hand in that too, over the centuries. A lot of those votive masses I talked about that led to the low mass, they were written by lay people. They were written by lay people. They were written, they were all written by clergy, by the way. Okay? Some of the great poems that we have, even in the Breviary, are considered, some of them they think might have been written, written by lay people, not actually clergy. Okay? Um, in any case, you know, like I said, there's so much out there. If you love it, you'll want to learn about it. All right? Um, so hopefully, you know, this conference has given you a little more impetus about the idea, um, maybe help to inspire you to like, you know, I'd like to learn how to better participate in Mass and make the Mass mine, so to speak. Um, the more out of it, basically just immerse yourself in our church's sacred liturgy and to become sanctified through that and to become more like Christ-like through that and to become more like the saints like that. So thank you very much for your, taking the time to listen to me. Thank you. I, I am open to questions if anybody wants to Dr. Kaplan, that's amazing. Kaplan. Sorry? Dr. Kaplan. Dr. Kaplan, yes. So I've seen uh, people that every time they genuflect, they do the sign of the cross. Is that like, are you supposed to do that? Or is that okay? Or is that just personal preference? Or? It's a personal preference. Well, here's the thing. So the liturgy teaches us the best way to do the gestures and the references and the reasons for that. This is the, it's the best, the liturgy is the best teacher because it's the most balanced. So the reason in the liturgy we do not genuflect and make the sign of the cross at the same time is because they mean separate things and they're also different. Usually you don't combine the gesture with the change in posture or an active posture at the same time. Okay, so that normally so when you make a double knee genuflection, it's just a bow. Okay, when you make a genuflection, it's just a genuflection straight. You're not even bowing your head when you genuflect, by the way. The celebrant is not supposed to genuflect, not supposed to bow his head at all during the genuflections that he makes. Okay, um, so there is that distinction there. I know it's become a pious practice for some people. I'm not, I'm not going to condemn anybody for doing it, but just say if you really want the best ideal practice, follow the sacred liturgy. That's what I always tell people because you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. It's the official practice of the Roman Catholic Church. I, I and I, by the way, it's a personal testimony or anecdote. I used to do that. I used to make the sign of the cross and Jane Fuck St. because I thought it was more holy to do so. And I remember actually it was my my pastor, Novus Ordo, came up to me smiling and said, 
I know you like these kind of things, so I'm going to tell you, he says, but rubically, that's incorrect. I'm like, what? Really? Just, they mean two different things. You're not supposed to do that. Just so you know. Walk off. <laughs> he called me his high church altar server at that time. Okay. So, but I mean, this, I mean, he was ordained in 1957, and he's, he's deceased now. God bless him. I'm seeing him still. But I learned about, a lot about liturgy through him, because even in the context of the Novus Ordo, he insisted we do things well. And he insisted we had practices. Um, we didn't have altar girls or anything like that. We served mass like it was a 1965 missile, actually. It was, I mean, it was very different than what I saw in other parishes when servers just kind of stood there. Really. But, uh, anyways, any other questions? Thank you Thank very much. Okay, um, in order to try to, to uh, get back on our schedule here, let's plan on having uh, Lisa's final talk tonight after dinner. So uh, we'll schedule that for 6.30, if you don't mind. Uh, dinner's on your own, but we will also have uh, food that was left over from lunch back here. So if you want some more bowl cuts, you can do that. And um, we will kind of rearrange our schedule as we need to. And your interest will be a, a major part of that. So if you want to tell us exactly how you want to do it, we certainly can. All right? Uh, so let's uh, take a break, and then we'll get back together with, with a new schedule here shortly. Thank you all very much.